Here you have a wonderful opportunity, a platform to expand uh, your viewership, to expand your following, those whom you later say that you represent, right? It should be something that you, you're eager to dive into, right? It's not an issue of us having to be angry with one another, frustrated with one another. Uh, you go on later to say that I'm frustrated with you, and I'm really not. I'm, uh, I, again, I don't know you personally. Uh, I see your ideas and I want to engage with them because I believe you're wrong. And I, I want to demonstrate that carefully. Why? Because I believe, Andrew, ideas have consequences. And the consequences that we're dealing with here are the lives of unborn children coming at the expense of people's irrational, immoral arguments. Hello, my name is Jeremy Ubroth. I'm a pastor of Emmaus Road Reformed Baptist Church here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And this is a response to a response of a response that I made to a student newspaper, the Colorado College Catalyst, on the issue of our protests, and really just our willingness and a desire to dialogue with students about the issue of abortion outside of the Colorado College campus. And so let's take a look here at this uh, article here. Um, here was the post, uh, why do the college campuses rage and students conspire in vain? And um, here uh, we have a back and forth conversation between the actual article's author and myself, Andrew Hoffman. And uh, he reached out and said he appreciated that, that I was willing to take the time and respond uh, to his article. And I want to spend some time looking at how I responded to him. I said, hey, Andrew, I'm glad to hear, at least I hope, that you took the time to watch through the entirety of my response to your article here. With opinions as strong as yours, it comes as no surprise that you were unmoved by my arguments. And that's going to be an important part to this response uh, video here. Um, I'm not really actually concerned that he's moved or unmoved by my arguments. A matter of fact, I don't expect him to be persuaded, and I'll explain more as to why. Uh, in fact, I have come to expect this sort of standardized response from the students at CC. It's a pleasant surprise and a breath of fresh air, really, when on the rare occasion someone is willing to interact with what I've shared, instead of being condescendingly dismissive, suggesting it's unworthy of one's time to engage, right? So let's call a spade a spade. You're taking a cowardly way out from having to defend your views because I'm convinced that you realize they're indefensible, having been undoubtedly shown here to be irrational, incoherent, and morally bankrupt. My response to your side note below is an excellent example. So I put, uh, you can just take a look at the video and see what I, what I had to say there, okay? If what you believe is true, Andrew, it is indeed worthy of consideration and debate. I think that that's going to be the crux of my discussion here today. If what Andrew really believes is true, he, he's not going to be concerned about whether he persuades me or not. He should be able to defend it quite coherently, quite consistently, right? We would say the same thing about my position, which I believe we have the only consistent and coherent position. So the issue is not my, my problem with Andrew. I actually don't know you, Andrew, and I don't know um, many of the students on campus personally. Uh, my issue is with the idea that stands behind, the philosophy that's behind the support for pro-choice movement for abortion. And so I go on here. If your challenges to my thoughts are so robust that you unflinchingly hold to your original argument, then why aren't you eager to defend them in a public setting? You should be, right? I mean, that's, if you really believe what you believe, it should be something for you easily to be able to represent. The same, and the same, uh, I have the same onus, right? Um, I should be able to easily provide a defense uh, for my position as well. Uh, so the, the responsibility is on both our shoulders to do so. Uh, so then I go on here, I say, why are you concerned about my mind being changed? What about the readers and listeners, right? So here you have a wonderful opportunity, a platform to expand uh, your viewership, to expand your following, those whom you later say that you represent, right? It should be something that you, you're eager to dive into, right? It's not an issue of us having to be angry with one another, frustrated with one another. 
Uh, you go on later to say that I'm frustrated with you, and I'm really not. I'm, uh, I, again, I don't know you personally. Uh, I see your ideas, and I want to engage with them because I believe you're wrong, and I, I want to demonstrate that carefully. Why? Because I believe, Andrew, ideas have consequences, and the consequences that we're dealing with here are the lives of unborn children coming at the expense of people's irrational, immoral arguments because they want to be selfish. I think that, that those are easy things to prove, okay? So you should be concerned really about the readers and listeners. Here's your opportunity, Andrew, right? So I've now created a, a response to your article and now a response to your response to my video. And this should be a wonderful opportunity, a great platform for you to expand your ideas. You shouldn't run away from them. And that's why I called you a coward. That's not ad hominem. That's describing your response to my response. It's, resp it's, it's describing your behavior. Uh, if you're not a coward, then, then stand firm. Show and demonstrate why your ideas are so robust, okay? Why you believe you have a consistent argument, why you believe that your position is the coherent one. That should be easy for you to do, right? So if you believe that what you are arguing for and favor for is true, then defend it, my friend. Don't be a coward and run away. That's a cowardly thing to do, okay? Uh, so as I go on, I'm sure that they would love to hear why you are so confident that I'm wrong and unworthy of your time. You've obviously figured it out, right? You got it figured out, bro. So it should be pretty simple for you to defend. In my response uh, to your side note, of course, you're an agnostic pantheist. In your mind, rationalistic autonomy rules supreme. You believe that you are left to define reality from your limited finite experience. Unfortunately, pan-everythingism will always issue in agnosticism because you can never really know anything if you believe all is one. All diversity is lost. Along with it, one's value theory. We merely are what is swallowed up in the oneness of everything, right? Um, if I were to add on to that, it's the oneness of everything that you believe that we're a part of. And of course you're agnostic because you actually can't really come to a knowledgeable conclusion if all is one and we are part of the oneness of everything. That's an irrational position. There's no distinction. There's no diversity. There are no categories in a pantheistic view. I'd encourage you to dive in a little bit deeper into uh, what pantheism really is. That's why I called it pan-everythingism. I took that idea from Francis Schaeffer, and he's written quite extensively on the idea of pantheism. So I would encourage you to look into that. Uh, consider how you make distinctions in a pantheistic worldview. You can't. Categorically speaking, there are no categories. There aren't, because all is one, and it's a part of the oneness of everything. We, we get swallowed up into the unity of everything, and I hope that makes sense. Uh, and I'd encourage you to, to go further. So if you believe, Andrew, that there are distinctions in things, my encouragement to you would be to question then from an agnostic, pantheistic view how you can hold those things coherently. Uh, I believe there's tension there that you have to wrestle with and deal with. We live in a, in a, in a world, in a cosmos, I believe a unified, ordered, created order, that has unity. There's a unity that is expressed in it. Um, the example being, uh, for instance, uh, the Heroclitean uh, River, right? Where the river is the unity, but the diverse parts make up the river. Um, the cosmos are, are a diversity of things unified in the oneness of the universe, um, and so on and so forth. So you're gonna struggle with the problem of unity and diversity and your views. So if you believe there are distinctions in this experience of ours, then you're going to really struggle holding coherently to pantheism. So I'd encourage you to wrestle through this. Uh, so we go on here with a little banter back and forth. Um, but I want to deal, Andrew, I, I want to take some time and deal with your thoughts here. I thought, uh, this is interesting. This is a development. This is actually where I was hoping the conversation might go, okay? And this is a development in our understanding and the differences between the two of political outworkings of beliefs, of our worldview and the way we examine evidence and so on. So let's just, I just want to dive right into this. Look at this right here. Um, you say something here that's really interesting. You say, uh, you're, it's frustrating and obnoxious to the people that you care about, uh, and I'm clearly not going to stop. I, I, honestly, Andrew, I don't know why it's 
um, frustrating and obnoxious. Again, if you hold the coherent perspective of reality, if you hold to a view that is virtuous, right, morally, on the moral, that has the moral high ground over my position, and it speaks truthfulness, truth, it speaks truthfully about reality, then it shouldn't be frustrating outside of the fact that you're just frustrated that I'm not speaking truthfully about reality. And maybe that's what it is. Okay. But going back to my original point, it's not something that you dismiss. It's like, oh, well, you just won't understand. So I'm not going to talk to you about it anymore. Okay, fine. It, even if you believe that I, I just wouldn't understand, Andrew, and I'm just not going to agree with you, again, for the sake of the readership and for myself, maybe I need to wrestle through these things and better understand. Can you please provide a defense of your ideas and a critique of mine? Can you faithfully represent and articulate my position to the extent that I would agree with you? That I would say, yeah, no, Andrew, you're exactly right. 100%, that's, that's what I believe. And then provide an internal critique of what I believe, showing and demonstrating its flaws. I think you try to attempt that here, and so we're going to work through that. But look, I want, I want you to look at this right here. This is a really interesting statement. Okay. Very interesting. Okay. It says, to provide context to my previous comment, I have no interest in debating with a person who will attempt to justify democratic political policy with theocratic doctrine. All right, Andrew, that that's really interesting. Okay. So one, one thing I would want to know is, um, now that you've pigeonholed me into a corner saying, basically, because you're this type of person, and I use the example of a Nazi. You're a Nazi, right? I'm not saying that you're calling me that. What I'm, I'm using that as an example to say, because you're a Nazi, and this is the way that you think, it's a complete waste of my time to engage with your thoughts. Think about that, Andrew. Like, I could say the same thing about you. Because you're this way, because you're an agnostic pan-everythingist, it's just a complete waste of my time to engage with your thoughts. You're not going to change your mind. I'm not going to change my mind. We're two ships passing in the dark. And so it's a complete waste of time. So you're going to rant on the catalyst and here, because that's what this is, bro. This this response to me is a rant. This isn't um, a rigorous approach to my thinking and a critique of my thoughts. You just ranted. You were angry. You even expressed that later that you were upset about what I said. All right. And accused me of ad hominem attacks. I can't find a single ad hominem attack in what I've shared. And you're, I'm totally open to correction if, if uh, uh, I'm wrong. But look look at what you're saying here. You're basically saying, you're this kind of person, so I'm not going to talk to you. Andrew, That's we're adults here, okay? And the expectation of you as a college student uh, is time to grow up. It is, because you're going to have to interact with people you disagree with for the rest of your life. Uh, maybe your spouse, your future spouse, will be one of many coworkers, uh, people who you're doing projects with in school. You're going to have strong disagreements with them. You're not permitted to just cowardly walk away and say, well, you're just this type of person, so I don't have to deal with you. I don't have to interact with you. I'm sorry, but you're just not going to be successful in life if that's your attitude. You're just not. It's not going to be acceptable, Andrew. At one point, that's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to you, and that's not an appropriate way to treat people, okay? So we need to move on from that. What you need to do is, even if you disagree with me, and let's say you don't like me, and you think I'm obnoxious, you don't appreciate me. You don't, you don't like my face, right? <laughs> um, you don't like the things I'm saying. You, you hate the religious position that I hold. That's okay. That's all right. I tell you what, what I'm going to stand for, Andrew, and I'm, I would fight and defend for, is your ability to interact with my thoughts. And I'm not going to ignore you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take the time out of my precious schedule, which I have very limited time to do, to carefully interact with your thoughts and show you this is what we should be doing together. This is, this is part of being a human. This is part of being an adult. This is really important. So let's interact together. I want, I want to show you something here real quick. You say, an attempt to justify democratic political policy with theocratic doctrine. Okay. So you touched on a significant issue regarding the difference in our political views and its social political, political outworking, okay? Uh, the justification of democratic policy with theocratic doctrine is a very important issue, okay? And I can actually justify it. I can, okay? First, uh, it's important to point out that, uh, as I'm sure you're well aware, that the United States government is not a purely democratic system, right? 
Uh, it is a democratic republic specifically designed with checks and balances to avoid or at least slow down the detrimental outcome of a monarchy and or a pure democracy. Why? Because those result, Andrew, every time, whether a monarchy or a, or a pure democracy, its outworking, its consequence is either tyranny or anarchy. Every time, okay? Those concerns sparked the American Revolution, also known as the Presbyterian Revolt. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term or not, but that's what it was originally called. Um, it influenced the development of our founding documents of the uh, Constitution, as we know, okay? So for the record, Andrew, uh, our country's founding uh, have mostly Christians and others operating within a basic assumption of a Christian worldview. And you have that to thank for. You should be thankful for that, that, that our original founders operated within the assumption of a Christian worldview. Uh, that is to say that there was a creator who we would have to give an account to ultimately that would hold all accountable to our way of thinking and our mode of life. So although that's a rapidly deteriorating understanding in, in our present sense, that was reality in the early American setting, okay? And uh, ironically, one can quickly point to innumerable examples where folks that share your irrational, incoherent, and morally bankrupt worldview, uh, they take for granted our present system's blessings, which give you and others like you, the very freedom to develop and express your beliefs. You're actively working to destroy those very safeguards our country's founders put in place to protect that very right. So consider that for a moment. Andrew, if we held to your worldview, just this belief system that you hold, this uh, idea that um, there should be a democratic political policy and that should not have anything to do with some theoretic, uh, theocratic doctrine, you're dead wrong. Everyone's beliefs, everyone's religious views, I'd encourage you to go just look up Google, do a Google search on religion uh, and what religion is. You have a certain belief about the world around you, certain value system that you've developed from that. You hold to that with, with firm conviction enough to respond to me here. And that, in its basic sense, can be considered a religious belief, Andrew. It can be. And so what you're saying here is that Religion, or theocratic doctrine, the, the term used, should not be involved directly in any sort of uh, politics in, in the outworking of our social political policy. And I would say, Andrew, then if, if, who's, if my religious beliefs aren't allowed, then whose are? And how do we determine that? That's a big question. If my religious beliefs aren't allowed, I'm, Christians aren't allowed to encourage their beliefs within public policy, then who's ours? And I'm assuming you're going to say something along the lines of, of, of a secular interest, that secular interests should be the ones that are advanced. The problem with that is, Andrew, we get to the problem with anarchy. We get to the problem with tyr tyranny. There's going to be some group that exalts, exalt, exalts itself above the other, that comes to some common consensus about the world around them, which is based in pure skepticism about it, and they're going to impose their views on others, and sometimes by force. It's just a, uh, we're caught in another king of the hill battle, if you will, okay? So that's a problem, bro, and you're going to have to wrestle with that. And I would say, as a Christian, coming from a Christian perspective, you live in a theocratic world. Christ is king. He's on the throne, whether you like that or not. And that's the very reason we stand out uh, in front of Colorado College, in front of Planned Parenthood, and elsewhere. That's why we preach the gospel. We're declaring him as king, and that you have an obligation and responsibility to be obedient to him. He died on the cross on our behalf so that we could be obedient, Andrew. That's the reason he laid down his life, because people are lawless, people like yourself, people who want to come up with uh, what is right in their own eyes instead of being obedient to God, the God that they know, the God that they are rejecting. So that's the reason Christ died. That's that's the point of the gospel, Andrew, is that he died, he lived a perfect life on our behalf, he paid the ultimate price, facing God's wrath, suffering under it for us, and our unrighteousness was imputed to him, and his righteousness was imputed to us. He, ra he was uh, raised again from the dead on the third day, 
um, having conquered death and vindicating his ministry, vindicating who he is as the God-man, um, fully God, fully man, and paid the ultimate price on our behalf for our sins. And he has now ascended to the throne, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and we are to proclaim his kingdom, the good news of it, all over the world, that people's sins can be forgiven, that lawlessness can be stopped, and that lawlessness once and for all will cease, and death will ultimately be destroyed. That's the purpose of our mission, Andrew. That's what Christianity is, okay? So let's move on here. Um, you again go into what you think um, are inconsistencies in my position or inconsistencies in the things I've shared. You say, furthermore, your argument was riddled with contradictions, dismissing scientific theory, but appealing to observable fact. What is empiricism? Laugh out loud. Slippery slope fallacies. I, I'm assuming you're saying that that's what I'm guilty of when I said you are, okay? If we define moral consideration on sentience, what's to stop us from eugenics like the Nazis? And then demands for validation. As soon as you heard that I won't debate you, you call me a coward and result to ad hominems. And so I want to deal with those one by one very quickly here. Uh, firstly, scientific theory, uh, not all science is created equal. People approach science, and that is knowledge, their understanding of the world around them, their observation of the world around them through a philosophical lens, a worldview, a certain belief about reality. That's what I addressed in the last video that I said. I encourage you to go back and look at that. So, yes, there are facts that are observable, but then the question is about those facts, Andrew, if you listen carefully to what I said, not all facts uh, are interpreted the same way, right? Um, we have a different interpretive philosophy, the way we look at the world around us, the way we understand it. And so my encouragement to you would be to go back, uh, look at that video, and look at what I said about interpreting facts. So I don't agree. I, I'm not an empiricist. I'm not a strict empiricist. Empiricism is um, that I can only learn about reality based on my senses, my sense experience. I'm not a strict empiricist. I believe that we have a necessity of revelational epistemology in order to interpret the context around us accurately. You lack that, Andrew, which is why your um, philosophy results in skepticism and agnosticism. You don't know. And a matter of fact, if you really take it to its logical conclusion, you actually can't know reality as it is. You, you're simply guessing at it. And so that's my view of empiricism. I'm very familiar with Platonic and Aristotelian philosophy. I'd love to dialogue with you about that and, and my understandings of them and how uh, Christianity can make sense of the forms, of the phenomenal and the noumena, how uh, it can make sense of our experience in this world. And Plato Platonic philosophy could not, and neither could Aristotelian philosophy resolve what he, where Aristotle believed uh, Plato was in error, and so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, um, some have even said that all of uh, hi historical philosophy from Plato and Aristotle are merely footnotes of them, uh, and they spend the majority of their time still to today arguing and debating about the same exact things in a different way, more rigorously, and they're still chasing their tail. And so I'd love to talk to you more about that. I, it's something, it's a subject that's uh, highly interesting to me. Okay, so you talk about slippery slope fallacies. The slippery slope fallacy, Andrew, is that when you begin to determine the value of a person based on something that you impose upon them and not their intrinsic value. So you say a person's valuable or they become a person somehow magically because they have sentience. That's a slippery slope. And the reason it results in eugenics like the Nazis is because what's to stop you from moving beyond sentience to something else? Like someone who lacks the ability to fully function and we need to support them their entire life. Like a special needs person, okay? My baby sister's Down syndrome. My parents were encouraged to abort her uh, before she was born. She was born with two holes in her heart. They said that she would die. They said she would have a miserable life. They said she would, uh, it wouldn't be um, a life full, uh, a good life. And my parents decided to keep her and praise God that they did. She's 37 years old now, Andrew, and she's lived a wonderful life. Now, uh, different than yours and I's, but the reason it results in eugenics like the Nazis is because if you decide through some consensus and agreement with your friends and those who have the same worldview you do, that people are not valuable until the eighth month of pregnancy, there's a problem with that. You can extend that logic 
to any point arbitrarily, Andrew, it's a moving goalpost. That's why it's a slippery slope, okay? And demands for validation. I, I don't have a demand for validation, uh, Andrew, at all. I'm validated by the, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. He's, he's my validation. I'm a Christian. My value is found in Christ. I, I don't need your attention. I'm saying if, if you want to properly, uh, properly represent those who you say you do, uh, do so. Don't be a coward. It, and it, by the way, it's not an ad hominem to call you that. You're being cowardly. This, this uh, article, this response to, to my response to your article is a cowardly response. It just is. Let the reader decide, Andrew. If anyone's needs some validation, it sounds like my, you might. I, but I honestly, I don't, I don't feel bad by what I called you. I do believe that you hold to an irrational, immoral, morally bankrupt system. I, don't, I believe it's incoherent and inconsistent. And I'd like for you to, 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 to show that. I'd like you. I'd like you to demonstrate that. So uh, you go on here. Additionally, your appeals. Uh, here, wait, sorry. Additionally, your uh, appeals to listening to fetuses listening to music, music in the womb during late month pregnancy, precisely when they gain sentience and moral consideration, according to my framework. Well, again, uh, we have two colliding frameworks, Andrew, I know that. I know that that agrees with what you said. Um, but again, I am not, I don't base the value of a person. A fetus is a developing child in Latin. I don't, I don't value, uh, ascribe, I don't believe they were ascribed a value because they're now sentient. I was just giving you an example that they can hear music at a very young age. They can feel it. They can sense it. Uh, at a very early period in the pregnancy, much earlier than, than eight months but much earlier. And so sentience, again, is not how I place value on them. And um, I'm very, aware, very well aware of what you're, the framework that you presented. I've heard, heard the arguments many times. Again, we believe that children, developing children from the earliest point of conception, we're talking the fertilization of the egg, conception itself, okay? Uh, when the, the, from a zygote to a fetus, um, what well, embryo, zygote, fetus, right? From the, all those stages, all developing children, all those Latin terms just mean a developing human, a person uh, inside a mother's body, they have intrinsic value because of that. They're a human. They don't become human at some point later. Okay, I think you use the example of Homo sapien. Um, I, I don't accept that term. Uh, I'm not a Darwinian evolutionist. They are a person, a human being from the point of conception. They're just smaller than you and I. Okay. And the science proves that, the observable science. If you want to speak truthfully about reality, that's what science proves, Andrew. You're, you're going to have to make up some philosophy of science that allows you and gives you uh, ways out, uh, you know, through language, use, using language like zygote, fetus, embryo, things like that. Um, all sorts of what I call um, philosophical gymnastics, if you will, through language to allow yourself an out from denying the factual reality that it's a person, a human. They don't change their information, okay? So I also make claims that fetuses is having moral consideration, so therefore they participate in social contracts, but the framework that I laid out uh, do not exist yet moral beings, so they cannot possibly engage in social contracts. Right, yeah, nobody's arguing that, Andrew. I, I know you don't believe that they're moral beings yet, uh, but you ascribe morality in a different way than Christians do. I, I understand that. I totally understand that. Uh, you have, again, a different worldview, a different belief about reality than I do. I, I hope I can make that clear to you. You have a different belief about reality. People are people from the point of conception because they're made in God's image. You reject that. You believe that people are given the value of human being or personhood at some later point using the idea of uh, conscien uh, consciousness, uh, sentience, right? The sense experience that they have. Uh, Christians don't do that. And so this is a moot point here. Um, the question is, is what's speaking truthfully about reality, Andrew? Is your position speaking truthfully about reality or is mine? 
And then how do we mediate that? How do we decide between that? That's the most important issue here. Additionally, you argue that my ought claims are grounded in nothing, which is precisely the point. Now, this is really interesting. Even theists make their knowledge claims based on faith. God exists, faith. We ought to listen to God, faith. Those are general assertions that if we accept them, the argument will follow. Uh, I just started a different point, so we will argue past each other and never come to genuine consensus. Um, and I honestly, I agree with you here, Andrew. I, I've been saying that the whole time. You're making a faith claim, and I'm making a faith claim. That's absolutely true. Uh, by faith, I stand in the position, biblical position, and you, by faith, stand in uh, a quite undefinable position, one that cannot justify reality, one that cannot justify facts, one that cannot justify your knowledge claims at all. Matter of fact, your knowledge claims don't make any sense of reality. They don't comport with reality. They, they can't contextualize things in a way that ha gives us a meaningful experience in life. You have no ability to provide moral grounding for things like justice, uh, for things like equity, and uh, righteousness or doing the right thing, right? You, you don't. You just don't. You have no grounding. I do. I, I have a biblical grounding. I have a historical testimony, one that dates back thousands of years, one that actually gives you the very framework for how you ought to live your life. And if you decide to go against it, here's the interesting thing about the biblical claim, and I'm so glad you brought this up, that if you don't by faith embrace these things, you'll find yourself not being able to make sense of anything. It's called the, uh, the argument from the impossibility of the contrary. That if you deny what Jesus said, if you deny the biblical testimony, it's historicity. Uh, if you deny the claims over who you are, the reality God has created, and again, try to make up a way that you ought to live your life in God's created order, you'll find yourself always in conflict with it, in conflict with yourself. You won't be able to make sense of the mind, consciousness, numbers, all the things that you take for granted right now, this ability to express ideas and then expect me to understand them and expect me to speak truthfully about them in your worldview. Now, in the Christian worldview, Andrew, I can tell you why you're accountable to God, why you must speak truthfully, why you must have moral grounding, why you should live your life in a particular way, why killing children is absolutely wrong. I have, I have a grounding for that. You don't, even though both of our claims are faith claims, indeed. Okay. So, again, you talk about, um, about how you believe the debate is pointless. Um, and the students are condescending to me. And the reason, okay, the reason the students are condescending, Andrew, is because they hold this idea that this is a pointless debate, right? And the reason why, Andrew, is that they believe that they hold the moral high ground. They believe that they hold um, a philosophical position that is more robust than Christianity. They believe that they're the ones being coherent. They're the ones being truthful about reality. They're the ones telling us how, the, how we should live. And because we disagree with them, they laugh at us, they mock us, they don't engage with our, our arguments, they don't engage with our understanding of reality, our understanding of the Christian worldview. And instead they say, well, you're just stupid. And there's no point in dealing with you because you're wrong. But they can't prove why. They can't show why. And so it's condescending because they're admitting to having some truth that they're unwilling to share, Andrew. Do you see that? Uh, you just wouldn't understand it anyway. So you're this kind of person, so I just won't share it with you. Do you see how condescending that is? Imagine if someone treated you that way. Imagine if I was like, oh, well, Andrew, you're just not a Christian, so you just won't get it. You're just a, you know, a pan-everything as a agnostic, and you're just, you're silly. And so you wouldn't understand it. There's no point in interacting with your ideas. And then just pat you on the head and walk away. By the way, that's not the way we should be interacting with each other. I can say that emphatically. Emphatically, I can say that because it's, uh, it's disrespectful. It's inappropriate. It's not loving. It's not, lo it's not kind, and it's not speaking truthfully. That's why. Okay. So you said, I genuinely believe that you are a good person. I don't even know what that means in your worldview, Andrew. Listening to the way you talked about how you love your child was beautiful. And the consistent, respectful tone of voice was certainly admirable, and it's easy to get heated in these debates. But like I said in my article, I highly doubt I would convince you, and I don't think that I'm convincing you now. Again, I, it's not about convincing me, Andrew. It's about um, in, engaging and interacting with the, the thoughts that I've shared. 
right? And, and the way I've interacted with you, I would hope that you would do the same with me. And you haven't here, Andrew. Andrew, paragraphs are a thing. So when someone writes like this, okay, and you're a journalism student, okay, and, and I imagine if you turned something like this in to your, uh, for an assignment as a way to respond with someone's ideas, I would hope that the teacher would fail you. Because, bro, this is not, this is a rant, okay, and I obviously understand that this is a, a social media platform. But if you notice, I provided clear ideas. I was respectful to you. Clear responses, clear ideas in formats that are easy to read and easy to understand. You can see where I'm coming from here, bro. Just just as an encouragement to you. This is hard to follow. You can tell when someone gets angry, they just, what I call keyboard vomit, right? We're all guilty of it. We've all done it. Where we just fly off the handle and we write. Uh, I actually was going to write a thorough response back to you on this, and I decided not to. I decided to do a video response so that you can see my body language, you can hear my tone of voice, and you can see that it is my desire to respectfully engage with your thinking, um, but I, I'm not interested in ranting like you've done here, Andrew. Uh, and I, I don't believe that I'll convince you because you want to embrace your worldview. Uh, just like you believe that you can't convince me. Again, it's not about convincing one another, Andrew. It's about faithfully defending your position, faithfully articulating the other side's position, whether you convince them or not, whether you per persuade them or not. That's not the point. Is it have you faithfully interacted with the ideas presented to you? Have you done a good internal critique? Is the At the end of it, let the reader decide. Let the listener decide who's right and who's wrong here. Right? I mean, it should be pretty easy. Uh, that's, I learned that in college, Andrew. That's what I learned. And that's actually what I'm hoping for from the CC students. I hope that um, in the end of this, I've demonstrated what, what it looks like to be a good student uh, and a listener and someone who's, who cares and who's concerned, but is also being uh, taking the mature approach and not doing ad hominem, ad hominem attacks, excuse me, who is... Uh, doing a fair internal critique, who is rightly representing the other person's views, which, Andrew, that's exactly why I'm just reading directly what you're saying and interacting with it. And I hope, hopefully I'm faithfully representing you and I'm dealing with the ideas and I'm not attacking you, okay? Like you said uh, yourself, CC students have rarely changed their minds. So with that, I don't really care anymore about what you're doing. I made my stand for the people that I care about and let them know why your argument fails and provided them a viewpoint on why your methods are illegitimate. Again, illegitimate according to whom? To what, Andrew? You? Your opinions? Your ideas? The Bible calls them vain philosophies. And the reason they're vain philosophies is because, uh, honestly, if, you're just, if you just admit it, you're making them up. They're just your ideas, Andrew. And you've also learned them from other people. And it's just a way for you to give yourself an out from having to see reality as it is that children are being killed in the womb. Persons, just like you and I. And so um, you go on to say, with that being established, you can continue to stand in the cold for hours begging for a conversation you aren't going to get every Wednesday. And you're raising money for Planned Parenthood. And I guess you're hitting your goals. An organization who... Uh, abortion clinics you decry. I decry them because they're murdering innocent children. The Bible says that God hates the hands that shed innocent blood. It breaks my heart that you are contributing to a business, which by the way, the Bible says very clearly, it's not just people who kill their children, but it's people who give hearty approval to those who do. It's in Romans chapter 1, right there at the very end. So you're contributing to an organization that is mindlessly barbarically murdering children. And so you're going to be held accountable for that, Andrew. That's, that's a sobering thing. And, and the sobering thing about it is, according to what Scripture says, you're doing it, and, and you think that you're, that you're holding, again, the moral high ground, that your arguments and methods are le legitimate, but you're not able to provide any justification for that based on your belief about reality based on what you know. So um, you say here, sorry if that, if that last bit comes, a uh, comes off vicious. 
you kind of pissed me off. I don't, I don't know why I made you mad, uh, Andrew. I don't. I don't know what and what I shared made you mad, except for calling you a coward, taking the cowardly way out, which is what you're doing. Um, and, and this is equally the same, bro. Uh, it doesn't matter to me anymore. If it didn't matter, Andrew, you wouldn't write an article about it, and you wouldn't have responded to this video. So it does matter to you. Uh, you just don't like to talk to people about it. You don't want to have to engage with it intellectually. You just don't. You'd rather dismiss it, feel justified, and walk away, poo-pooing me and those who stand in my position instead of wrestling with the ideas themselves. So this debate is pointless, and I'm not going to respond to you any further, as it clearly makes both of us heated, and we aren't really having any significant impact on the world around us. See, now... Uh, I disagree with that. I'm not, hopefully I didn't come across heated here today. I'm not heated. Um, I'm, uh, it's sad. I, I'm really disappointed that people kill their children, Andrew. And it's, it's what motivates me to preach the gospel, to declare the good news about Christ's kingdom, that ultimately one day all of this will be put to an end, that death itself will be swallowed up in Christ's victory over all things, which he accomplished on the cross. Um, but it's sad. It's sad that people kill off their children. It's sad that people destroy their future generations. It's sad to me that they leave, they have no in, uh, inheritance to leave, no one to care for them when they get older. It, it, it is, uh, it's a horrible decision, and it's taking the life for selfish reasons at the end of it, for unscientific reasons, irrational reasons, um, for, for some gain now for some temporal gain now it's sad that kids are losing their lives because of that Andrew that's sad and so I'm highly motivated so how how am I going to make an impact on the world around me well we are internationally Andrew if you go to endabortionnow.com you'll see that that thousands of children's lives have been saved thousands parents who have come to us and said I'm so glad you stood out here with these horrible signs and, and encouraged us through the megaphone because we have to stand 400 yards away from Planned Parenthood and shared the, the message that there are other options. I'm so glad that you offered to help us financially. I'm so glad that you offered to give us physical needs like food and diapers. I'm so glad that you encouraged me to just reconsider what the child is inside my womb. I'm so glad that you decided to um, stand out here and make a difference. We know 70% of women turn away when they see someone uh, standing uh, like us, like our organization and others. Uh, people have come up to us and shown us their ultrasound pictures saying they've decided to keep their children. Uh, people who in tears are so happy that they've decided to. There, there are stories of children who are going to be aborted who, you know, they're your age, Andrew, now, and they're, they're fighting for the lives of other children saying they're so happy their parents decided to keep them. And their parents are there with them fighting along in the fight as well. So, Andrew, I'm, I'm making a big impact. And so are you. You're making a huge impact on the world around you by contributing to an organization that is destroying generations. 60 plus million children just in America alone. Thousands uh, every, every year. Thousands of children lose their lives because of your contribution and your uh, vain imaginations, your ideology. So we're both making an impact um, one for the better and one for the worse. And so you say here, you conclude, I only responded uh, to you because it seemed important to you that I elaborate more on my reasoning and that you insulted me, so I'm a little bit mad. Uh, think whatever you want about me. I truly don't care. Whether you believe me or not, have a nice day. I love the little Grogu figure, man. Man's mad cute. Man is mad cute, whatever you say there. So uh, I, I believe you responded because I am making a, an impact I believe our message pierces through to the conscience, Andrew. I, I don't. I believe it's unavoidable. I believe it's inescapable. I think that you know that you're aware of that. Um, that you know quite clearly that taking the life of a child, an unborn child, is wrong. Uh, it provoked you. It makes you mad, and I'm I'm glad to an extent that it has. I hope you consider it and think about it, whether or not you interact with me ever again. It doesn't matter to me. Um, ultimately, what I know is you're going to face God. You're going to face your King, Jesus Christ, one day, and you're going to give an account for every idle word, every idle thought, and every idle action. And that apart from Him, apart from His work on the cross, uh, on our behalf, 
that all of us, just like you, um, all, all those who, you know, we were all worthy of judgment, Andrew. And um, I hope you think about what I've shared. I really do. I hope that uh, the Word of God has an effect on you and that you come to Christ. And then ultimately, one day you join us in the mission to end abortion. What a testimony that would be. I, I praise God for that now. So that'll be all on that. Uh, so with that said, I hope that those, uh, Andrew, I hope that um, those may be following along in this. I, I, I really would like to do more stuff like this because I think that video responses are so, they're more helpful. You can just see the person's body language, right? You can see the person's demeanor. As, as Andrew said her earlier, that um, he appreciated my tone of voice, uh, that I was, uh, um, I'm not angry, right, by any means. I don't know why you would say that, but... I think it's important. I, I think we miss out on that. We lack that in the uh, social media world, right? People can easily keyboard rage behind a screen, but what they don't see is the image bearer, that precious image bearer, that eternal creature, God's creature who he loves, sitting behind the other side of the screen. And uh, so I wanna make sure that these types of things happen more frequently, that we do these things, so that people can see really, hey, look, I, I care about what you said. It's really important to me. Uh, it should be important to other people. And uh, I've taken the time to walk through your thoughts. And I certainly hope that you give me the same respect that I've given you. So, yeah, uh, if you have, uh, if you guys have any other thoughts, recommendations, uh, I assume that um, we'll have that radio interview coming up pretty soon, which I'll provide another video. But if you guys have any thoughts, recommendations for things you'd like to see, things you'd like to see us interact with here in Colorado Springs, specifically on the issue of abortion and maybe other things as well, uh, please let us know and uh, we'd be eager to do that. So uh, God bless you. Thanks for joining us today.